So finally, as promised, part four, boat electrical made easy, to help you with your boat. If you haven't watched parts one to three, please do so first before watching this part, otherwise it won't make sense to you. If you've already done that, well, let's dive straight in, shall we? Okay, last time we talked about AC and DC power, alternating current and direct current. Now remember, DC is a smooth throw of electricity in one direction. Boat batteries are DC. Alternating current is constantly changing direction at a given frequency. Mains power is AC at 50 or 60 Hz. Now you also remember we talked about how current travelling through a wire gives off an electromagnetic field and how this can be focused in a coil of wire and used to move things. So there's actually two circuits here, one switch which is making another switch, a bigger switch, close. And this is how it works. When the current is switched on by closing the switch, the electricity th flows through the wires and coil. The switch or contacts are pulled in and a bigger load can be switched on until the switch is opened again, stopping the current from flowing. So that's the quick recap on what we learnt in the last video. Let's move on again. So what about AC current? Well, because AC current is constantly changing direction at 50 or 60 Hz, depending where you live, that's 50 or 60 times every second, the magnetism it creates in the coil or wire does the same. It changes direction. Or to put it another way, the magnetic poles change from north to south and south to north. This changing of direction can be used to change the voltage either up or down. I think the best way to explain this is to show you how your battery charger works on your boat in a few steps that you can follow. So here's a drawing of a transformer. It has two coils of wire that are insulated and wrapped around an iron core. One set of coils has a lot of turns around the core and the other has fewer. These coils are exactly the same in principle as the relay or solenoid that we looked at in the last video. As the AC current flows through one coil, it induces a magnetic field in the core. The second coil picks up this magnetic field and becomes electrically, well, inducted or powered up. In simple terms, the coils are not connected to each other, only wrapped around the iron core. And here's the clever bit. In this way, electricity has been sent from one coil to the other through the iron core. If we change the number of loops or coils around the core, we can make the voltage go up or down, or transform it. Hence why it's called a transformer. So here's an illustration of a simple transformer. And this transformer we would call a step-up transformer because it's stepping the voltage up. So how does it step up the voltage? When we put five turns or coils around the right hand or primary of the core and ten turns around the left hand side, the secondary of the core, these two coils change the voltage from 100 volts AC to 220 volts AC. And this process is done by electromagnetic induction. The number of coils or turns on the primary and secondary coils are directly related to the stepping up or stepping down of the voltage. If we want to make the transformer which produces 12 volts from 240 say or 110 we would simply change the number of turns on the secondary coil to the number that relates directly to the turns on the primary coil. Let's give you an example. 110 volts to 220 volts is a ratio of 10 to 5, which is the same as 2 to 1, because 220 divided by 110 goes exactly 2 times. So to get 12 volts from 240 volts, we simply do the same maths. The ratio is 20 to 1, because 12 goes into 240 exactly 20 times. If we have 100 coils on our primary, we need to have 1 20th of that on our secondary, or 5 coils, or turns. 
Now transformers actually have hundreds or sometimes thousands of turns on both the primary and the secondary, but the principle of the ratios remains the same. Once you know the principle, you know how it works. OK, let's summarise what we've learned. AC power changes direction at a given frequency. The changing of direction causes magnetic poles to change in a wire or coil. If two coils are connected together around an iron core, AC current can be made to step up or step down in voltage. This stepping up or stepping down is how transformers work. But remember, we're still talking about AC and we need DC to charge our batteries. So how do we change AC to DC in our battery charger? <coughs> this is a diode. And this is the electrical symbol we use for a diode. Now don't worry, we're not going to in-depth electronics. But you need diodes to change AC to DC. Remember we said that DC travels in one direction and that AC changes direction at its frequency. Going back to what we learned about electricity being like water, if we wanted to have water flowing in one direction only and not the other, we would use a check valve or a one-way valve, wouldn't we? So meet Mr Diode. A diode is a component that allows current to flow in one direction but not in another, just like a check valve. Now diodes are what are called semiconductors. There's a lot of diodes on your boat. They're in the back of your alternator, they're on your charging circuits, and they're in your solar panels if you've got them. But we'll explain more about diodes perhaps in another video. Here's a simple circuit diagram for a battery charger. Now before you all run to the hills and hide in the caves, I'll explain this bit by bit. It's really quite simple and you already know all the principles of how this works. So, this is our transformer. And these, these are our two coils, primary and secondary. This is the soft iron core. And these are four diodes arranged in a diamond pattern. This is our load, or battery, that we're going to charge. By placing four diodes on the secondary coil of the transformer, we can capture the current as it tries to flow one way and allow it to pass as it flows the other, just like a check valve. We call four diodes in this configuration a rectifier, sometimes called a bridge rectifier. There are other components most chargers have, but these are the main ones. And you now know how it works and all the principles behind it working correctly. So this simple diagram of a battery charger with its transformer and diodes is changing 240 volts or 110 volts to 12 or 24 volts to charge your batteries. You now know how your battery charger works and its main components. Once you know how something works, you know how to fix it or what to look for when it doesn't work properly. So, here's a word of caution. It goes without saying, when poking around in something that uses higher voltage AC, there's a risk of electrocution. You should be able to test the coils and transformer without the mains connected. But if you need to test live, you must ensure your test equipment can take the voltage it's in and is insulated. We'll cover testing in another video, where we'll link everything you've learned to date and show you some neat tips and tricks in fault finding and repair, but for the moment we just want to cover the basics. So there's one more thing to cover before we start looking at fault finding and it's probably the second most important thing you'll need to know in both electrical works. Yep, the dreaded electric motor. Electric motors work many systems on your boat including your bilge pumps, winches, windlasses, freshwater pumps and even start the engine with the starter motor. Now you know the principles you've learned in previous videos, you'll be amazed how simple they are, and actually easy to fix. Let's get started. 
So this is the best illustration of a simple motor I could find on the internet and thanks to techfact.com for letting me use it. There are two permanent magnets. We call these field magnets. One has its north pole facing in and the other its south pole. Then there's the rotating core which is wound around an armature. And then finally the commutator and the brushes. In this illustration there is only one rotating coil on the armature, only two brushes and two points of contact on the commutator. That's because it's a simple electric motor. We'll show you later how this can and does vary on motors, but for now let's just say this is a simple motor designed to illustrate the principles. Power is supplied to the commutator from the brushes. Your motor will generally have carbon brushes, one positive and one negative on a DC motor. The commutator is positioned on the armature or motor shaft so that the coil's electromagnetic repels the coil and it rotates. As the commutator turns with the coils and the armature there is a blank spot on the commutator. This stops or interrupts the current flow. The armature and the commutator have momentum so they continue to rotate. Then the current is picked up again by the commutator. This time the two pickup points are 180 degrees rotated. This means the coil picking up the current in the opposite direction because the brushes remain in the same position, positive and negative. But the commutator has rotated. With the current reversed in the coils, the electromagnetic poles change and once again the magnetic fields repel, forcing the armature to rotate and the process continues again and again. In this simple electric motor, a current passes through a coil in a magnetic field. This forces the left side of the coil upwards and the coil rotates. When the coil is vertical, the current shuts off for a second. The current is reapplied and the other side of the coil moves upwards. This is the simplest model of how electricity creates mechanical energy. That's one of the best explanations I've ever seen. So, there are other laws like Ohm's law governing electric motors, Faraday's law of induction, Lenz's law, Lorentz's force, Ampere's circular law, um, Fleming's left hand rule for motors. These are important but not essential for you to know to repair the electrics on your boat. There are other types of electric motors like AC motors and brushless motors which work in a different way that are being used more on boats these days. But maybe we'll cover them another time. But for now you've progressed this far. You're ready to start with practical fault finding and learning how to use the testing equipment with all the stuff that you've learned. This is the basics. Next time we'll look at some real practical stuff. Well done you guys. And I'd just like to say thanks for all the positive feedback. So many people have written to me or PM'd me and said they've really learned a lot. And this is what we wanted to do this series for. So let's get on to the practical stuff next time. So here's some of the equipment that we use on our boat. An automatic multimeter with DC sensing, conventional digital multimeter, good quality insulated screwdrivers, a cheap crimper, stripper, a good set of electrical pliers, side cutters and a good set of crimpers. Also a high wattage soldering iron. We also have an Antex good quality soldering iron. Tie wraps, heat shrink and then a box full of crimps, terminals, glands, switches, bulbs, fuses and all sorts. And I'll be showing you why this thing is the most lethal piece of equipment an electrician can use, in my opinion. Thanks for watching, I hope these videos have been of help to you. Please like and subscribe. More videos in this series coming soon. Sail, Sail safe! safe.